Where are all the non-trivial zeros? The general idea in this video is to find a function that will show where are all the non-trivial zeros located by using a to function convergence region to find real zero values. In the previous video I showed you three equations. The first equation was the eta function. The second equation was the movement of eta function on the real axes. The third equation was the movement of eta function on the imaginary axes. We're now going to call the second equation that represents the movement of eta function on the real axes f of x. And the third equation that represents the movement of eta function on the imaginary axes g of x. Let's show both of them together and we will start an animation that shows the first 100 steps of the two functions. I deliberately showing you the case when the real part of a to function is 1 half. I could have shown you a simpler case where the real part was 1 or higher. But I wanted to show you this to emphasize and to clarify what happened when the real part of a to function is 1 half before we will start. Now let's see the next 900 steps also. As you can see the two functions converge to the analytic continuation value. Well, almost. Because that's only the first 1000 steps, the convergent to the analytic continuation value will occur at infinity. In the previous video I suggested that eta function getting a zero value when s real part is one half. Well the fact is when s is below real part one the eta function is not converge absolutely everywhere. As you can see, when we look at the first 10 and 11 steps of the eta function when s real part is one half there is a gap. And if you will look closely you will notice that those two lines are rotating around an imaginary center line which is the analytic continuation line. Now this analytic continuation line should get a zero value at point 1 half plus 14.134725i. But because this is the first 10 and 11 steps the summation is not even close to a zero value. Let's try this animation again only now we will let eta steps to grow rapidly and please notice how fast the eta function's arms getting close to the analytic continuation line. What I want to show is that when the real part of s is one half then the eta function can get a real zero value at infinity. I will also show later on chapter 4 and 5 that when real part of s decreases from 1 to 1 half it can have real zero values but below real part 1 half there aren't any. Meaning that the lowest point that the function can get a real zero value is when the real part of s is 1 half. Let's watch this again but only this time I will add also the real analytic continuation and not only the first average point of the 10 and 11 steps of the two arms of eta function. As you can see the real analytic continuation is in purple color. What you see as analytic continuation number 2 in a green color is only for the first 10 and 11 steps. This is why it's not even close to the real analytic continuation that is in purple color. Let's try this animation again only now we will let eta steps to grow rapidly and please notice how fast everything getting close to the analytic continuation line. We will let the animation to reach the zero point at 1000 first steps and we will also zoom in. Let's first set the zero point. Now we will increase the number of steps to 100,000.
and later on we will see why at infinity it will reach to zero only when the real part is half. All of this was only an introduction and now we can begin. I'm going to create a new function h of x from f of x and g of x. This new function need to be equal to zero only when both functions f of x and g of x are zero as well. The simplest way to achieve that result is to have h of x equal to f of x squared plus g of x squared. This way h of x equal to zero only when you have non-trivial zeros. Let's first test h of x first 1000 steps so that you will have a visual confirmation about the idea. Good. Now let's extract the real formula for the non-trivial zeros that we want out of this new h of x function. We will first start by splitting the screen into two sections. That is because the procedure is identical on both cases. Now we want to know, to what f of x squared and g of x squared equal to. Now let's open the brackets. Now let's emphasize with colors all the matching objects. Let's add every matching column to its row counterpart, except for the middle diagonal line, and we will get this. Those are the formulas for f of x squared and g of x squared. Now let's combine those two functions to get h of x. It's the same summation rule on both cases because they are only differ by the sine and cosine functions. So this will be simple to place each part to its matching summation rule on them both. Let's take the common factors outside the brackets. Please notice that we have two trigonometric identities on both of the summations. The first trigonometric identity is an angle sum identity. The second trigonometric identity is a Pythagorean identity. If we will replace x l n n instead of a, and x l n k instead of b, we will get this. Let's rearrange a bit. Notice that we got zeta of 2a on the right side summation. And now let's write h of x in its final form. I want to point out that this formula is true for the entire region of a. The formula is not using analytic continuation when a is below 1. Let's check our new function just so we can have a visual confirmation. Now let's see an animation of the first 30 steps of our new function h of x. Please notice how it becomes stabilized on the analytic continuation line. And this is the first 1000 steps of our new function h of x. I want to point out that at infinity the function h of x will be equal to zero at those well-known non-trivial zero places. But this I will only show at chapter 4 and 5 using convergence tests. Ok, let's go back to our h of x formula. h of x is always bigger or equal to 0. Let's move the summation to the left side of the inner equation. Let's insert the minus 1 inside the summation formula. Now we will call this new summation formula q of x. q of x is always equal or smaller than zeta of 2a. But if h of b is equal to 0 then q of b is equal to zeta of 2a. So when q of b is equal to zeta of 2a then the point zeta of a plus ib is a non-trivial zero. At chapter 1 I showed you that for real part of s above 1 there can't be non-trivial 0. 
Nevertheless, I am going to show you the case when the real part A is equal to 2. When the real part A is equal to 2, then the supremum value of Q is equal to zeta of 4. Meaning the supremum value is pi to the 4 over 90. When the value of m is increasing then zeta 2a is also increasing but when m will reach infinity zeta 2a will be equal to pi to the 4 over 90. I am showing you this graph so you can almost have some visual confirmation that q of x won't reach the supremum value. At chapter 1 we saw that non-trivial zeros of the zeta function can only be at the critical strip. But when the real part a is equal to 1, we can see that the supremum value of the function q of x reaches zeta of 2. Didn't we already said that the Riemann zeta function has no zeros on the line, real part of s equals 1, and that it was proved in the year 1896? So what's going on? Well remember the Dirichlet eta function formula that I showed you at chapter 2? The function q of x is using a to function summation, meaning we added roots to our search. All those red dots are the roots when 1 minus 2 to the 1 minus s is equal to 0, meaning that when x is equal to 2 pi r over ln 2, where r is any non-zero integer then q of x is getting the supremum value of pi to the 2 over 6. Now let's look at the case when the real part a is equal to 1 half. Remember that at the beginning of this video I told you the two functions f of x and g of x converges to the analytic continuation value and that convergent will occur only at infinity. And also that at infinity the function h of x will be equal to 0 at those well-known non-trivial zero places. Well I told you that I will show you this only at chapter 4 and 5 using convergence tests but I now want to show you a visual confirmation with the q of x function meeting the harmonic series at those well-known non-trivial zero places. Please notice that as m getting bigger and bigger from value 6 and above, the function getting more and more stabilized to its final convergent form and those non-trivial zero places are increasing with the same value as the harmonic series has. Now I want to show you also a visual confirmation to those two cases I just showed you when the real part a is equal to 1 and to 1 half. Let's look at the transition of the real part a from the value 2 to the value 0. Look closely what happens when the real part a is equal to 1 and to 1 half. When the real part a is equal to 1, then the supremum value of q is equal to zeta of 2, which is pi to the 2 over 6. At this region when the real part a is between 1 and 1 half there can be theoretically non-trivial zeros when q of x will be equal to zeta of 2a. For example, if we want to find any non-trivial zeros on the real part 0.75 line, we will get q of b equal to zeta of 1.5, which is 2.61237. And if there will be any b value that do satisfies that equation, then zeta of 0.75 plus i b is a non-trivial zero. We will see later on how we can use this with the help of the functional equation to our advantage. When the real part a is equal to 1 half then the supremum value of q is equal to zeta of 1, and zeta of 1 is the harmonic series which equals 2 infinity. This is the region when the real part a is between 1 half and 0. I am not going to elaborate about this region now because I am saving that discussion for the next chapters.
I would like to point out that where the real part A is below to one half and above zero, then the supremum value of Q is between the harmonic series and M which is infinity. It's infinity because the harmonic series is above ln M plus the Euler master only constant and below or equal to M. That means when M is approaching infinity then the supremum value of Q is also approaching infinity. On the next chapter I am going to do convergence tests and talk about conditional convergence and absolute convergence with regards to zeta of 2a. If you can't wait for the next chapters and would like to know more and also want to support me then please check my VIXRA link in the description section below. If you have any questions regarding to all of this or something wasn't clear then please let me know and leave a comment below. There's more to come, so stay tuned.